Hello, hello from London. Good to be back with you. I was just at St. Thomas Hospital yesterday. Met a wonderful uh, eye surgeon, and looks like they're putting me in my fast lane to get my other eye. Other eye. Uh, this is my bad eye. <laughs> with cataract surgery on the 16th of December. We hope you in America, maybe other places, have had a good Thanksgiving season. Actually, on Thanksgiving evening, we had a great 60th anniversary of OM Scotland and UK up there in Perth. Very wonderful. Thank you, any of you that were able to be with us. So uh, encouraging to have fellowship with people. And there were about two hours of fellowship before the meeting. Uh, we had, had, hadn't seen for a long time. I wanted to just remind you that especially during this Christmas season, we try to increase the distribution of these gospels. This one happens to be, well, yeah, it is English. And um, if you can use some of these free of charge, mainly in English, if you're in India or UK or North America, other places, it's more difficult. But if you email me, I can maybe let you know how you can get it in French and, and, and Spanish. We give these completely free of charge, including paying for the freight. You have to email me and send uh, your address. I'm sure you all know my email address. And what you don't know is how much I appreciate the emails, especially finding out what countries you're from. I'm interested in knowing how many different nations, they're all, I've got a flag for every nation of the world on this jacket. So I wonder how many of you come from one of these countries. You might be the only one in your country that's following these blogs. Well, we're continuing our series of 10 unusual men that I've had the privilege of meeting or knowing. We know there's many, many other great men of God that I, of course, have never met. And we just thank the Lord for all of them and all the ordinary people who make up the teams. We see in the word of God that there is quite an emphasis on unusual people. And that work of the Holy Spirit continues. And we just thank the Lord for it. And uh, I've learned more from some of these people than I have from others. But all of them have been a challenge and a blessing. We're starting the list with. A very unusual Englishman, uh, Leonard Ravenhill. This is his big, thick biography, almost impossible to get a copy. Came many years after his death. He was a great friend of OM. He spoke at one of our main conferences. I remember there in Memphis, he wrote Why Revival Tarries, which so many of us were reading in those days. Sodom uh, had no Bible. Um, Mildly used, very unusual man, ended up living in the States. My last fellowship with him was, I think, one of his birthdays. And Keith Green, who we'll talk, I'll talk about in a future uh, blog, was with us. The second person I want to mention uh, today is a man named Billy Jones. And there's the book of, about Billy Jones by Chaco Thomas, who right, right, works right here in the office just down the lane. The remarkable story of Billy Jones, surely one of the more unusual people to join OM. He was a very noisy brethren and married an extremely quiet Pentecostal Pauline. The story of God bringing them together and God using them is just fantastic. And some of you will want to read about it. I'm sure quite a few of you actually met Billy Jones. He's an unforgettable, unforgettable person. And then the third person on the list is very influential man in the early days of OM. He was used greatly in, in some kind of revival in North Africa. His military history before that is very unusual. I'm speaking of Ralph Chalice, who um, was fluent in French, though he was English, and spent his life uh, his ministry life in France, a great influence with many of our leaders. One of the main speakers at the early, early conferences. Um, I think we have some of his material maybe on tape. I was listening to some not so long ago. 
uh, he, he left us that great book. I think it's called From Now On, I Don't Have It Handy. And then the fourth unusual person is Alan Redpath. Alan gave us a number of books. I met him in Chicago, one of the first major Christian leaders in my entire life that took me to lunch. I'll never forget it. And then he organized a prayer night. I think from what we were doing in the prayer nights at Moody, he organized one at Moody Church. And little did I know, of course, we would both end up living in England. That's one of his most well-known books, The Making of a Man of God. Many of his books, of course, are out of print. And we just thank the Lord. I'm in touch, actually, with his granddaughter, who's doing a wonderful ministry in Birmingham. Her mom is actually still alive. Yes, Alan Redpath ministered. And stayed on the ship for a while. Um, Keswick speaker, he upset quite a few people at Keswick because he was strong also on the Lordship of Christ. And some people felt, ooh, uh, he's gone too far. And then the fifth person I wanted to mention is Ray Lynch. Uh, Ray only went to be with the Lord about two years ago. Uh, Ray was the number one street preacher in the history of a whim. Literally tens of thousands profess faith in the open air meetings of Ray Lynch in India, all over the world. Eventually he visited every nation in the world. There's actually a book about it. That's rather hard to get, but if you want it, I can uh, try to get you a copy. And Ray Lynch and I were very close. It's only a, a miracle. I was ever in California around 63. Uh, early 63, and was able to meet him. His situation was very complex. No normal mission society would be able to take him on, but uh, OM was ready, and he spent his life on Operation Mobilization. He loved to be on the ship and mobilize people to go out with him. Of course, I've been, I was one of them more than once. And then the sixth person uh, would not be well known today at all, but he, his name is Lionel Gurney. He's the founder of the Red Sea Mission Team, who, have, who of course, like so many missions, changed their name. I think it may be Reach or Reach Out now. I have trouble memorizing all the new names, especially when I've been in touch with hundreds of different societies. Lionel Gurney was one of the first really senior missionaries to be very pro OM. And he actually got me into that famous Bangor Convention in Northern Ireland in very early days, I think maybe the 60s. As he got much older, he, he loved staying on the ship and was one of the pioneers of reaching Muslims with the gospel. Certainly an influence on our movement. I think I may have met him. At Moody, I'm not sure, but we certainly became close friends later on. And then number seven is F.F. F. Bruce. Well, I actually only met him once or twice, but I'll never forget a big Bible convention down in, uh, in Devon, maybe Cornwall, the Moorlands Bible College in its original location, Dawlish, I think. Anyway, we were both speaking that night, but I came late. And uh, it was set for me to speak first and him to speak second. And I arrived late, but it was good enough to go and speak. But they stopped me and they said, look, you, you need to stay here. He, he needs to speak first. F.F. F. Bruce was a great writer, but he was a rather boring speaker, most people said. And so they said, uh, you're better to speak at the end. Um, that was my introduction to F.F. F. Bruce, his book on Bible manuscripts and how we can trust the Bible uh, were a great help to many, many people. And then the eighth person is Ellie Maxwell. Um, we were looking for his biography. We have copies somewhere, but he was the founder of Prairie Bible Institute. Prairie to get in Canada together with Moody in America was the two um, co colleges that sent out the most missionaries. And we soon developed a very strong relationship with Prairie. And I had the privilege 
of being with him. I remember him sitting in in the front row of a message I had to give to the high school. They have a high school connected with Prairie. And it was the subject of sex. And I thought this dear elderly man, he was no longer president. Uh, he's not, you know, he might be a little upset with this. But he came to me after the message and he said, you know, this message is so urgently needed. What the Bible says about sex. Uh, his grandson is the president, <clears throat> Mark Maxwell of the Prairie. And we have a lot of contact and they just celebrated their 100th anniversary. And then the ninth person, of course, well known over 10, 10 million of his messages downloaded through the internet. Uh, and that's Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Again, I have to thank Tony Sargent. And Tony's with us and not well, pray for him for introducing me to Lloyd-Jones. He may have helped influence Lloyd-Jones to speak on the Dulos in the mid seventies, uh, right there in Docklands. And that's the first tape. He gave me special permission to do, to record and distribute. He didn't allow any of his other messages to be distributed by tape. That all happened after his death. <clears throat> but that one message, which I've listened to a dozen times, the spirit and the word was immediately released and has gone around the world ever since. Of course, he's written uh, so many uh, different books. This is one of his very older books. Why does, why does God allow war? <clears throat> Very, very uh, relevant, of course. And um, my favorite book, which OM distributed thousands of copies of, Spiritual Depression, <clears throat> Its Cause and Its Cure. What a, what a legacy. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's take a little water here. What a tremendous legacy. <clears throat> These men... Uh, have left behind. Behind most of these men were great women. And we celebrate their lives just as much. Uh, we just believe only heaven will tell the story. And then the final person uh, in our session this morning is John Stott, again, who left us just so many amazing books, especially Evangelical Truth, but even more uh, basic. Christianity, which is a great evangelistic book that God has used in such a powerful way. John Stott and I would get together almost every uh, year, though initially we clashed because I had the evening meeting at Urbana in the late 60s, I think stepping in in place of Billy Graham. I didn't give an expository message, which was really his big thing uh, very strong-minded about it, especially at that time. I just gave my testimony. It was such a short time and uh, a few verses at the end and thousands stood to make commitments of their lives as I touched on the, the area of moral purity. But he confronted me the next morning saying how disappointed he was with the message. He didn't know how highly I esteemed him. And uh, he wanted to express you know, the lack of biblical content, except the verse, verse or two at the end of the message. Of course, I'm an emotional case. I just broke down and cried. I don't remember what happened after that, but soon we were sitting in his, his flat in London fellowshipping and uh, answering some of his questions as he had some really strange ideas about OM and our method of recruiting Cambridge students. Around that time, the word was out that George Verwell was the Pied Piper of Cambridge. These students were going out and supposedly never seen again, which, of course, wasn't true. So we talked through those things and uh, just had such great encouragement. And of course, speaking in All Souls Church years later uh, certainly is one of the highlights of my ministry. Actually, the memorial service for John uh, for. John Watts and Keith Beckwith back in the, the mid 60s that took place at least at All Souls Church. What a legacy John Stott has left behind. Another single man 
like Lionel Gurney and others, and uh, so many people all over the UK today, and some of them, like Richard Buse, have gone to heaven, uh, have received so much from John Stott. What a privilege to share about these men whose lives and books have been a blessing and influence to me and so many others. And we hope you'll appropriate uh, the opportunity to get into some of this great material. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.